can switch to the full screen here. Okay. So the first first hour we're going to talk about testing, and the first part is an introduction to what is meant by testing, uh, functional st testing as opposed to structural testing, and then we will move on and we'll discuss functional testing, or if you prefer, requirements oriented, or if you prefer, black, black box testing. Okay. So these are the points that more or less tell what is the purpose of this section of the course. Uh, learn the fundamentals of testing. Uh, some theory, but you will see it's, it's, it's just very little and simple things. Uh, how to do and use black box testing. Uh, understand what is white box testing. Tell a little bit, talk a little bit about coverage criteria. We'll talk about them later. Uh, there will be another section, another lesson, but this will come late in the course about conformance testing. And define and use methods for unit testing, checking coverage at the source level. Uh, and tell some, also something about the connections between the two types of tests, why they are in a way complementary and helping each other. OK, so let's go back for a second to the B-cycle. Uh, B-cycle, you remember, left side is refinement and development. Right side, it is verification and testing. Okay? And we said the other day that the blue lines means that tests should be planned for early in the development. Whenever you do the functional specifications, very define the test for the system. Okay, so you plan while you are refining on the left side, and then you execute when you go back on the right side. Okay, functional or black box testing. The assumption is that in this case, the system or subsystem under test is really a black box. It's something for which we know what are the inputs, we know what are the outputs, we know the expected properties of the outputs with respect to the inputs, the behavior, and so on, because it has been described in a specification document. But we don't know what is the internal algorithm, what is the internal solution to the problem of the requirements. We don't know even what is the internal structure. Okay? It is typically used for system level testing at the level of the entire system or subsystems. Or for unit testing, when you refine the system down to the individual components and the component is described in a software requirement document, again, as a black box. So I, 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 you heard a lot, lots of time the word requirements. And indeed, this test is requirement driven. So when we talk about coverage here, we talk co about coverage with respect to requirements. Okay. The single property that, in most cases, you want to be true, I would say in all cases, is to have 100% coverage of requirements. Each single requirement has to be checked with a test. Okay? And you want to trace this coverage okay, to keep track of it formally using some document or some tool. We will see that actually you can improve the quality of the test by leveraging information about the function that needs to be performed inside. Uh, well, of course, they are implementation independent. Uh, this part is, is kind of interesting because it links right away to the structural testing. So you may ask, well, if I do these tests, is, is that all? Do I need some more? We will see that there are another type of tests, which are called structural tests. Okay? And, and I'm going to introduce what is meant by structural testing. So one example of structural testing is this time, suppose you need to develop a piece of software. You may have a specification for what the software is supposed to do. And on the basis of this specification, you have the black box test. 
But then you write the software that is performing the function, and you have a piece of code. Okay. So now you have a program. Okay. Now, structural testing means that whenever you are going to test the software that you develop, you need to make sure that after you execute all the tests, for example, each and every single line of code has been executed at least once by at least one of the tests. Okay? And this is one criterion for structural coverage. Okay? And it is 100% instruction coverage. Okay? But you may have different criteria. You may have criteria for condition coverage. Uh, you may have uh, you may have criteria. Sorry, for decision coverage and condition coverage, mix the two. Mix um, uh, condition and decision coverage. Okay. Uh, why do you need structural testing if you do functional testing? Why do you also need to ensure that your tests cover each and every single line of the code? Well, there are a number of reasons. First, we will see next that functional coverage, even when you get 100% requirements coverage, it's actually typically covering a very, very small fraction of the possible input space. Okay? Suppose you, you, develop a, you need to develop a C function that needs good to compute what are the two roots, if they exist, of a second degree equation. Okay? So you are given something like uh, a square of x plus bx plus c equal to zero. Okay? And you want a piece of program that, given a, b, and c, computes the real roots if they exist. Okay? Now, you, you, of course, you don't want to test for all the possible legal values of APNC, right? You're going to pick a subset of them. Any realistic subset that you can select is going to be only a small portion of all the possible input values. Okay? So one weak reason could be, well, functional testing, in any case, is going to cover a small fraction of the possible input space. But that, that's not the real one. That's not the strongest one. The other two reasons are that no matter how good is your process, your requirements almost invariably are not going to be complete and are often not going to be up to date with respect to the code. Okay? This means that when you write the code, the code is implementing something that is not in the requirements. And this could have two reasons. One is more or less banning, and it is, or, 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 or good, or well, it's not good actually, uh, but, but not so bad. And it is that you actually either forgot to write that requirement, or the requirement has not been updated after you find that you needed to cover some other requirement you, you just implemented. In the code, okay? So in this case, you will find sections of the code that are never executed when you test the existing requirements. And this is because these sections of the code are actually implementing other requirements that you never wrote in the requirements document and you never planned for testing. Okay? So this is the first reason. The second reason is similar, is that you still have in the code some functionality that is not written in the requirement and was not meant to be a requirement. So in this case, you have what is called unintended functionality. And again, it may be malicious or not, but the point is that the code is doing something that was not part of the requirements, and you need to understand if this is happening. Okay? So this is why you want to have structural coverage. Now, in the first case, what is that you do when you find that after you do all the functional tests, there are lines of code that have not been executed? You go into the code and you try to understand why. And if it, this is because there is a missing requirement, you go back and you add the requirement. Okay. In general, every time you generate tests for structural coverage, if you generate some tests that were not part of the original test plan, you need to understand why. Okay. okay. 
So this is basically the slide that outlines what is the structure or white box testing. Uh, and you will see that actually if you develop safety critical systems, for example, for the aeronautics, a very common criteria is to have what is called MCDC coverage, Modified Condition Decision Coverage. We will go back shortly to this. Okay? And unless you demonstrate that your tests indeed provide 100% MCDC coverage, your system is not going to be certified. Okay? So this is a requirement for sometimes a safety condition. Okay. What is the third type of testing that we are going to discuss? It is called conformance testing. Okay? Uh, I would say as time passes, this test is, is somewhat losing importance, but it's still a good criteria. Conformance testing, it is about checking whether an implementation of a model is conformant to the model. So you have a model, for example, a fan state machine. And then you have the code that is supposed to provide the implementation for this model. This code can be written by hand, or it can be generated by an automatic tool. We don't care at this point, right? We do have the model and implementation. And we want test procedures that allow us to check whether the implementation is a correct implementation. Okay? This is what is meant by conformance testing. And we will, when we will discuss conformance testing, we will see that in many ways it is similar to structural testing. Okay? You need to check against the structure of the model itself and provide coverage of the structure. Okay, as for the unit testing, we will go back to unit testing shortly. You may think of it as a special case of functional testing. We will use some very simple programs and utilities that you can use to perform unit testing. Okay? So we will develop some simple code, I think using Sigwin or, or a similar compiler, and then we will use one of these packages. Right now I'm using ctest, uh, but of course I mean other packages are cpptest or, or a number of those actually. There are a number of these packages that are open source and free available. Okay, this is it for the first part. Let's switch right away to functional testing. Okay, these are all the definitions that we're going to cover, uh, except uh, we're not going to talk about decision tables and decision tables. So we're going to say what is nominal testing, boundary testing, robustness, and so on. Okay? And many of these concepts will, will be fairly intuitive and simple. So again, uh, it will mostly be well, it will mostly be about definitions, what what is the meaning and what is the associated complexity to, to perform those tests. Okay? So for simplicity, we will assume that our program is an input from a, uh, is, is, is a basically a function uh, from a given domain of inputs to a set of output variables with their own domain of ranges. Okay? And so we can represent basically the execution of the program as a function that takes one input from this input domain space. So in case there are only two input variables, i1 and i2, we can represent the input space as bidimensional. Okay? Each and every program, we will go back to this uh, next, but I guess we already introduced in, in some ways when we discuss the requirements. Each and every program will operate within some given ranges of the input variables. So this domain will be defined for each and every input variable between a minimum allowed value and the maximum allowed value. Okay? So you will actually have something like this. And so we will formally define the space of all the possible input values as DIK. Okay? For each possible input IK. It is clearly 
in many cases, impossible to test all the input values within this document. Okay. So, and, and in reality, this is because, again, the, the size of this set of all possible inputs is basically the, the product of the sets of all the possible input values for all the possible input variables. So, first thing, was it, what is a nominal test? Well, given an input domain like this, we pick one set of input variables that falls within the domain space. And this is called nominal testing. We just pick one set of inputs that are within the valid ranges, and we test the system. We test the execution against it. Okay? Now, you may think, OK, this is what is typically done. This is what is typically done, and again, if you do, if you run one nominal test for each requirement right away, you may have 100% requirements covered. Okay, this is why it is a very weak condition. Okay, but you don't want to test a complex function with a single case with a single set of input values, right? The fact that it works correctly for this set of input values doesn't mean that the function is correct. So what is one possible way for getting more quality, more reliability out of your program? Well, instead of running one sim single test, you may think, well, let's pick a number of randomly selected input points in the input domain space. Okay. Well, this is not very effective, because typically, again, the domain space is huge. It's like billions of possible values. Okay, if you pick one or one hundred, doesn't change too much. Okay, the coverage is in any case going to be ridiculously small. Okay? <coughs> so you need instead of picking these values at random, you need to say, see well, can we actually select instead of random values something that are more significant than others? Okay. Is there a set of better values? Well, and the idea is that the starting point is like this. The idea is that once you have a nominal test, the likelihood of and, and, the, and the nominal test is, is working correctly. The likelihood of finding an error is much more when you pick values at the extreme end points at the boundary of the domain in this space. Okay? And so the idea is to go to the boundary, to pick boundary values. Okay? This is the, the starting concept for boundary testing. Okay? Well, before we go for boundary testing, we will need to, to, to first have some assumptions that are, at the beginning, not very realistic, but will allow, in some cases, at least at the beginning, to control complexity. And the idea is that the domain consists of independent values. So there is no correlation between the values of the inputs. This is not true, of course, in general. Okay? But this is our first assumption. The second assumption, this is not very strong. It could be relaxed without too much trouble, is that all the input values are continuous values. Okay? All our input variables, for, for now, we will think of them as real numbers. Okay? That, that doesn't matter too much. Uh, in, a, in some cases, you will also find this concept of testing near the extreme endpoints of stress testing. And this is because it is related to what is done for, for mechanical components. Okay? Whenever you need to test a mechanical component, you try to test this mechanical component near the stress point, near the point at which it is supposed to break. Okay. Okay, so Right away, what is about boundary testing? When you do boundary testing, you pick a nominal case first. And for example, in, in our simple case of two input variables, i1 and i2, uh, we select these two nominal values. In, in this case, it's, it's almost in, in the middle of the two intervals. But it really doesn't matter where it is. Okay? You need a nominal case. Then what you do is what you do, you typically keep one of these variables 
on the nominal value and you change the other. And if you have more than two, you keep all of them at their nominal values except one. And for that variable, while keeping all the others on the nominal values, you pick four more values. Two that are right at the boundary. There is the minimum allowed and the maximum allowed value. And two that are close to the boundary but inside the validity range. Okay. So now, you need the nominal case for all the possible input variables and for each single input value, uh, value or variable, for each single input variable you have four more cases. Two at the boundary and two close to the boundary. So now the total number of test cases becomes 4n plus 1. Okay. And we're making that again the assumption that they are independent. Meaning that the failure is the result of a single variable being at the boundary. Okay. And you see that already the number of test cases has grown. If you have, for example, five inputs, you go from one nominal case to 21 test cases for boundary test. Okay. Well, the slides are providing an example. It's, it's, it's a, a few years, a couple of years at least, that I'm trying to replace this example, which is clearly not an example for an embedded system into something that is more tailored to an embedded system. I'm hoping that sooner or later I will be able to do so. Uh, this example is taken from uh, the slides. You, you saw the first slide. There is actually uh, a credit to lessons from some other professor at Eindhoven who had slides very similar to those ones in this concept. So th this is borrowed from the, that set of slides. And the idea is to, it's basically writing a single, simple program uh, that, is called, that is computing the, 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 the maximum factor for mortgage. Okay, you borrow money and the bank wants to know how much money at the maximum you can give back on a monthly basis or, or, or a year basis or whatever it is. Okay. And this is typically a, a fraction of your salary. Uh, based on some conditions, the bank wants to know how much you can actually take out of your salary and, and use to pay the mortgage. Okay. And so, for example, some of the parameters that may be used are the gender, which we will take right now. Well, uh, in a program, it may be an enumerated, but in reality, you may consider it as a career. Okay. There are only two possible cases: uh, the age and the salary. So, of course, in a way, if you're young and your salary is higher, then probably the fraction can be larger. That's more or less the idea. Okay? And the specifications tell us that basically the factor is can be taken out of the statement. Okay? Now, we, we don't care whether this number are realistic based on the definition that I gave. Okay? It's just that this is the specification. And you want to write the program for this. So suppose that this is the, the program that's solving this, this requirements pro, uh, problem. Okay? So you are a manager of a company, and you are given the specifications okay, from the bank that wants this program. You give the specifications to the programmers. The programmers give you this piece of code. Okay? You want to know, is this correct? And we ship this code to the customer. Well, indeed, in this code, there are 12 bugs. Okay. And the idea is we want to apply this testing techniques. Okay. We want to apply nominal test first, then boundary testing, and then we will see that there is more. Okay. So before we apply these techniques, we need to figure out what are the input values. And what is the domain of the inputs? So the input values right now are the age, the salary, and the gender, right? So these are actually not real values, but as I said before, no big deal. So the age, well, 
actually, if you see from the table, oops. If you see from the table, the maximum age is going to be different for men and women. Well, actually, women live more than, one, than men, so it should be the other way around. But in any case, if you take the range for age goes from 18 to 55 in one case and 18 to 50 in the other. Okay? So you should consider this. Uh, so the real endpoints are 1855, but we will see that in case the person is a woman, then this goes down to 50. Okay. And then you have the salary, which is from 0 to 10,000. And the gender, which is a Boolean, true or false, so we need to pick one plus one. Okay. So nominal values could be, for example, 25. It's in the middle here. It could be 5,000. And it could be true for our group, okay? And we test for our nominal case. What if we don't get any boundaries? Well, if we don't get any boundaries, of course, we take the machine-specific boundaries, okay? Or type-specific boundaries, such as zero and maximum for the integers. Next thing is we go for boundary testing. So now, if you go for boundary testing, you need to pick four more values for each possible input. So in this case, we take 18, 19, 54, 55, for example. And here we pick 0, 1, 99, 99, and 10,000. And here we pick two or false. And we generate all these possible combinations with the nominal va uh, values. So you see here, salary is always at the nominal, except for the four boundary cases for salary. Okay. Uh, of course, gender is a little bit simpler because nominal case and boundary value are the same in most cases. Okay. And and again, for booleans, it doesn't make sense to have boundary and near to the boundary. Okay. So in this case, for boolean. It's actually always two values. It's not four and plus one, but instead of, of having four values, it's only two every time. Uh, you try all these possible values on our test program, and you catch the first one. So by using boundary testing, we detect that our program was faulty in one case. So of course, this has been written on purpose. But the idea is that there are 12 bugs, and by using nominal plus boundary, we only got one. OK, some observations. We already saw, but we are not going to cover here. I mean, this, this, this is just an introduction to testing. I just want to give you these definitions and an idea about how, how, how complex the, the, the problem is and some guidelines. But you probably already figured out that based on this description of the problem, already boundary testing is not a good fit. Because, as we said before, here the specification is actually consisting of a table. So instead of having a single domain, for example, for age, we have a number of subdomains. So in reality, our input space domain is already partitioned in some subdomains. And the input-output dependency function is defined for each subdomain rather than for a single big domain of all the input variables. Uh, therefore, probably it is a better idea to reason by subdomains. Okay, we will go back to that. Uh, second thing is that actually the R variables are not independent. And there is indeed a dependency between the age that is allowed and the gender. Uh, so in the end, we need to try more combination. And we need a finer partitioning of the of the input domain. Okay. So next step. In many cases, it is also a good idea to try input values outside the range, right? 
You so you remember the Ariane 5 case? Okay, the rocket that basically which the module was not expected to run for a rocket angle beyond a given point. And this is indeed exactly what happened. So this is especially true for systems that are dealing with the physical environment. Okay? When you have somebody that is typing at some keyboard, it is more or less, I would say less, acceptable to imagine that there is an input filter that if you type an incorrect value, is going to tell you a wrong input. Okay? But if you're taking values from a temperature sensor and the temperature sensor is broken, again, you may make the same assumption, but it seems much harder. So the idea is that you want to test also input values that are outside the range. And this formally takes the name of robustness testing, or more precisely, robustness boundary value testing. So again, we stick with the assumption that input values are input variables are independent. And for each input variable, besides testing the boundary values and the values right inside the boundary, we also test two values that are right outside the boundary, or in general outside the boundary. Okay? So now the number of test cases becomes 6n plus 1. And if we apply to our program, there you go, you start catching more bugs. Okay? Uh, th this is also typical. Okay? People are typically not very good at planning for unforeseen consequences of input out of range. Okay? Next step. This, we go more and more realistic. And do you remember the assumption we, 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 we made at the beginning? But basically, input variables are independent. Well, if we drop that and we say that the fault is actually the result of the combination of more than one input variable being in boundary conditions, this is where the number of case test cases blows. Okay, you have an explosion in the number of cases that you need to try because now you need to try the, all the possible combinations of the bar variables being at the nominal value or at the boundary conditions. And so now you have 5 to the n test cases. It means 2 inputs, 25 cases, doable. 3 inputs, 125. It depends on how many requirements you have. Uh, Typical number of requirements for systems is, goes from hundreds to thousands. Okay. So if you have something like 300 requirements, uh, well, right now we have a system in one of our startup companies here that has to test 300 requirements on 140 input variables. Not only in, all input variables apply to all the requirements, but you can imagine what happens to them. <laughs> and then, of course, you move next, and you have the combination of the worst case and robustness boundary value test. All the possible combination of all the seven values, nominal, boundary, close to the boundary, inside, outside the boundary, for all the possible values. Seven to the end test cases. Okay. Uh, well, okay, at this point, you can, you can move in. Okay. The idea is basically you can apply these techniques to our program test case and get, get all the possible bugs. Okay. But is there any way that we can leverage the fact that the input domain is actually consisting of subdomains? Well, th this is th the solution is kind of intuitive, right? If you have a number of subdomains for the inputs, like you have male and female, and you have different age ranges for males and females. You partition the input domain in regions. Okay? And now, you can have a weak <coughs> coverage of the input regions for each and every possible input variable. 
<clears throat> meaning that there needs to be at least one nominal value test for every input variable in one of the sub-ranges. So is there one test for this range of IU2? Yes, it's here. Is there at least one test for this range of I2? Yes, indeed we have two. And we have one possible test case for each possible interval of I1. And the number of tests, now we're back to the nominal test cases. Okay? So weak coverage of each and every input interval for every possible input uh, variable or, or value or signal is now the maximum of the number of regions for every possible input value. So in this case, the maximum is with M and M, where M is the number of regions for I1 and M for, uh, for I2. Okay? And okay, you can apply to the test program, you now define, based on the table, all the subdomains for age. You have a single subdomain for salary. You still have one subdomain for male or female, for our Boolean. And now you need to try one case for each of those possible age ranges. Okay. And you get more bugs. The next step is intuitive. Now you want one nominal case for each subregion. Okay? And now it becomes basically the product of all of the, the, the number of uh, subranges that you have to reach in that subregion. Okay? So in this case it is 2 by 3 plus 6. And already this number will, will grow pretty fast. Next, you apply, uh, for example, you, you can combine this with the concepts of robustness testing and boundary testing. You may imagine, right? So if you now you have weak, robust, just kind of sounds weird, uh, testing, this means that you want not only want one test for each and possible input subdomain, but you also want one test below the minimum value and one test above the maximum value. Okay? So now you have the maximum of the sides in terms of regions for each input plus 2 and And strong, robust testing and the number of test cases grows again. So instead of having the maximum now you have the product of all these sizes. And you can move forward and also go to the boundary of each single region and, of course, grow even more the number of tests. Okay. Which in this case is given by this formula here, the product over all the input variables of 4 multiplied by the number of regions for each input variable plus 1. In our mortgage example, very, very simple. Three input variable, simple description, simple table, there is already more than 100 test cases. Okay. So, okay. Take any real life program that, for example, has five variables, five partitions of the input domain with different dependency loads of inputs for outputs. You get in eight million test cases. Okay, this means hours of test. Okay, this is about functional testing, and this is about the testing part. So we will make a small break, I'll, I'll check the machines here, and then when we come back, we will go back to the system.